So we have the pleasure of a special speaker this morning. You don't have to listen to me. Can I get an amen to that? (laughs) All right, all right. I love you too. But I'm super excited about um, this morning. Um, Pete Frank is his name, and I was thinking about his titles. In fact, I asked him about his title. Um, He serves with a ministry called Gospel Link, and he is a director for Southeast Asia. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Um, But he's also a a father of four, five? Six. Six, that's right. (laughs) Adopted, they have adoption as a part of, adopted two as a part of their story, Um, and seven grandkids? Yes, two on the way. Two on the way. Um, So he's a husband, he's a father, he's a grandfather, Um, he is a leader in this ministry, Um, he is a servant of God. We met years ago at Moody Bible Institute, he was the president of the Parents Council, Um, and so he required us to call him Mr. President, so he may (laughs) correct you this morning when you meet him, Um, although I became the next president, so he has to call me Mr. President as well. But my favorite title... um, that I share with you this morning is he's a friend. Mm -hmm. He's a brother and he's a friend. Um, I have had the pleasure of watching God use him and speak through him in the lives of many people, including my own. And so I am very grateful for the opportunity. He, He flew from Indiana, flew out here just last night and he's flying back out tomorrow morning simply to be with us. And God has laid on his heart, thank you. God has laid on his heart a a message this morning, and so uh, my prayer is that you have heard from God in the time that's led up to this moment, and I encourage you to take out your Bibles, get your phone, your tablets, your Bible ready, Um, and Mr. President Pete Frank, would you come (laughs) and open God's Word to us, please? Thank you, brother. It's great to be here, and uh, thank you for the title, Mr. President. As he said, he became president after me, and the presidents tended to get a little shorter after me. So, um, you know, but True. big in heart, True. though. True. So, uh, I did come from Indiana, and I just want to say it is, it's great to be with you. I just so enjoyed the worship this morning and the fellowship. I have felt very welcomed here this morning. My hand is tired of shaking. Not, it's tired from shaking all the hands. It is well. Yeah, amen. amen. It is well. It is well. Let's pray, and then I want to share with you what I came all the way from the Hoosier State, uh, what God's put on my heart this morning. So would you bow with me in prayer? Father, it's so good to be in your house this morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we think of uh, Psalm 8-1. Uh, o oh Lord, O oh our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, all the earth, from Sacramento to Indiana to Southeast Asia. Your name is high and lifted up above all names. We're here this morning to worship you, to learn from you, to know and to go, and to be on mission in a greater way because of our time now in your word and through our worship this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus said in John 15, 20, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And Jesus was sent by the Father And we know Jesus suffered greatly for that. And as we were reminded in the passage that Pastor Kurt read this morning, John the Baptist was sent as a great prophet from God, and he lost his head for that. He suffered greatly. The apostles were sent by Jesus, and they suffered martyrdom and exile. And throughout church history, believers who take Christ's commission seriously have been sent and suffered for it. And even today, and I would say especially today, Persecution occurs on people globally simply because they are Christ followers. They know and they go. They count the cost to do that. Various forms of persecution from harassment to death. To death. Open Doors Ministries estimates that 13 Christians die daily simply because they claim the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's one about every two hours. And yet, as one pastor in Vietnam said, we have learned that suffering is not the worst thing in the world. Disobedience to God is the worst. The title of my message this morning is A Third of Us. Would you take your Bibles or your tablets and turn uh, quickly to Romans chapter 10? I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to talk a little bit like an auctioneer up here, all right? So you have your seatbelt fastened, your hat on tightly, 
and we're going to cover a lot of ground. So Romans chapter 10, a third of us, and this passage here in verses 9 to 13 of Romans 10 is just great news. It's all about salvation and about the gospel. John R. Stott, the great theologian, once said, what's on the screen, he said, we must be global Christians with a global vision because our God is a what? Global God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And these verses are all about salvation. So my question at the outset this morning is, have you been saved? Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you repented of your sins, put your faith in him? I did that way back May 4th, 1981. Many years ago and many hairs ago as well. As a 16-year-old sophomore in high school, I put my faith in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he's never failed me yet. How about you? If not, today is the day of salvation. Amen? But these verses are all about the power of the gospel, the power of the gospel to save souls. And we would say amen. But then we come to verses 14 and 15, and this is the mission's problem. And church, it's a big problem. Verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And here the Apostle Paul asks four rhetorical questions. Did you notice those? And if we were to flip this passage around and kind of look at it from a different perspective... Uh, The four main verbs there, it it could read this way. If people aren't sent, how will they preach? And if the word means to proclaim, to advertise, to make known. If the gospel isn't preached, how will it be what? Heard. And if the gospel isn't heard, how will people believe? And the answer to that is, These are rhetorical questions. The answer is, obviously, they won't. They won't. The gospel won't get to a person's heart unless it gets to their ears first. And it won't get to their ears unless people know and go and are sent and obey that command to go. Bearing good news. And that's where, listen, church, that's where you and I come in. We are in Romans chapter 10. Okay, we are are part of the solution here, if you will, to this missions problem. Because God has a plan to erase the mission's problem. It's the Great Commission, right? Making disciples, followers of Christ amongst all the nations, starting right here with our neighbors. That's God's plan. It's plan A that God has. And there's no plan B. This is it. And you and I are in the equation. And what a, what a cool privilege and responsibility. Jesus said in John 20, verse 21, as the Father sent me, And that's really kind of the key word that I'm bringing all the way from Indiana. All right? Sent. If you notice, as the Father sent me, and it's a theme throughout this message, and God's message to us, he said, so I am sending you. Because if God's people are sent, ears will hear, and many of those ears, hearts will will believe and be saved. Okay? I have three motivations for you this morning, three Great Commission motivations. Let me me go back here. I want to go ahead and share this story. So uh, the first time I went to Africa was 17 years ago, and I I just joined Gospel Link. And uh, I was there in in Africa with another Gospel Link representative, Willie Hunter, who lives in Kansas City, still with the ministry. Willie and I were in the southern African country of Mozambique. And one of our objectives was to go out into the bush and preach the gospel to the people, the local people, and also meet with some prospective Gospel Inc. native missionaries. So our 
van driver took us off of the paved road onto a dirt road. We're in Mozambique, Africa, a very poor sub-Saharan African nation. And we're zigzagging out through the bush for about two hours. I mean, it was a remote area. Willie told me later, he said, Pete, I think that's the most remote place that I've ever been to. And we finally got to our destination, and Kurt, it was pitch dark, and they stopped the vehicle, and they got us out and took us to what would be our lodging for the next couple of nights. It was a little mud hut with a thatched roof there in the bush of Mozambique, Africa. And Willie and I, we got out of the van and went into this little hut. There was a candle burning there to welcome us. It was like Motel 6. They left the light on for us. <laughs> Willie and I were just sitting there in that little hut. You know what they brought out and offered to us? Bottles of Coca-Cola. And I had to think back to Coca-Cola's mission statement, which was 20-some years prior to this, no, about 10 years prior to this. Coca-Cola's mission statement was a can of Coke in the hand of everyone on the face of the earth by the year 2000. And true to their statement, there we are. That was a picture of us in that little mud hut there in Mozambique, Africa. I had no idea where we were. We're in the bush of nowhere. True to their statement, there's Coca-Cola. And that's Willie and me getting ready to enjoy our, enjoy our warm Coca-Cola that, that night there. But I thought to myself, if a soft drink company can be so committed to a simple mission statement, how much more committed should I be to my Lord's great commission of reaching my neighbor with the gospel, of being engaged in, in uh, global missions? So three motivations this morning. One is we are commanded. We are commanded to the Great Commission. We could just go on to point two, you know, but let me elaborate that on that, or we could close the message, actually, right? We're commanded to be engaged in the Great Commission. Amen, church? Amen. amen. That's a hearty amen. We don't get amens like that in the Midwest. I appreciate that. But seriously, we are commanded. This is not an option. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, once said that the Great Commission is not an option for us to consider. Rather, it's a command for us to obey. We are the people God sends. We are his plan A. And all the great success in missions over the centuries, all the great success in evangelism right here in America for the past 200 plus years can be attributed to God. Amen. Glory to God. But also, also credited to those who took the Great Commission seriously. Like my sister who shared the gospel with me as a as a grade school kid, who got, she got saved at church camp, came home, and, and I was her mission field. And I'm grateful that she took that seriously. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 4, 19, he said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. So this great commission task that we have been entrusted with is inherent in the call to follow Christ. Jesus said, follow me. In other words, be my disciple, right? Be my disciple. Be a Christ follower. And I will make you to become what? Fishers of men. It's a play on words Jesus uses, obviously. But if you study that, he's talking about you will be making disciples. As disciples, you will be making other disciples. Disciples making disciples. That's a pretty cool model. And when we accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, we also accepted that call. I had no idea when I was 16. All I knew was I cried out for the mercy of God. I repented, put my faith in Christ, and said, you're my Lord and Savior from here on out. I didn't know all this at that time, and, but, but you know, I began to understand. He said, I will make you to become fishers of men. And it's not if God has called us to the Great Commission, it's to whom he has called us to. The Great Commission is not just for pastors, missionaries, church leaders. It's for every Christ follower. And the Great Commission, before we go to point two, the Great Commission starts closest to home. You know, I think a lot of times Christians get uh, off base in their focus, and we want to focus on faraway lands. And that's a good thing, but let's not overlook, because Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields of harvest. The fields are what's around us, right? Starts, he said, uh, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other post, most parts of the earth. And our Jerusalem, so to speak, is, for your sake, this area, right? California, Northern California, Sacramento. For me, it's Indiana, Marion, Indiana, Grant County, and, and expanding from there. I mean, my Great Commission starts with my neighbor, 82-year-old man named Meredith, a great guy. Uh, he lives kind of across the field from us. We live in a very rural area of 
Grant County, Indiana. And uh, he's not a believer. And I see him outside sometimes. He still mows the yard, you know, works outside his house and whatnot. I talked to him again yesterday before I went to the airport. Because I have a burden in my heart for Meredith. He doesn't know Christ. He's 82 years old. Listen, he knows it all up here. Pastor Kurt, he could probably get up and tell the gospel as well or better than I do. He's got it up here. And he knows this. But he doesn't have it here. We just Romans 10, uh, read Romans 10. With the heart, man believes unto salvation. With the heart, faith in the heart. In other words, putting your trust and faith in Christ, it goes beyond mental assent to the facts, right? I told him yesterday, I said, and I've told him before, you know, that's where my Great Commission starts, is my point, is with Meredith. He's my neighbor, doesn't know Christ. I told him yesterday, Meredith, don't miss heaven by 18 inches, right? You've got it all up here, but it hasn't moved to here. Don't wait too long. I said, one day it's going to be too, it's going to be too late. And he said, I know, one day it'll be too late. Where does your great commission start? Who do you have a burden for that needs the Lord? And who's better suited than you, as a Christ follower, to be a fisher of men with that person? So we're commanded. Secondly, we're compelled. We are compelled. Now, the gospel is good news. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel. Thank you for the gospel, the good news death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to pay the sin debt for all those who put their faith in him. But there's also good news. Proverbs 25 says, as cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. The double dose of good news this morning. How many of you like good news? Raise your hand. All hands go up. How many of you get good news in the media today and all the hands immediately go down? (laughs) If you want to really get discouraged, just turn on the news for about 30 seconds, right? And that'll do the trick. But the good news, church, is that the church is growing. The gospel is going out. It's like a a cup of cold water to a weary soul. So is good news from a far country. Let me just share some highlights in relation to global missions. Have you heard what God is doing in communist China? Communist China, Voice of the Martyrs estimates that there may be as many as 100 million plus believers in communist China today. Amen. Now the bad news is... That's about a tenth or so of the population of China, right? But the church is growing in China in the midst of persecution. Places like Nepal, it's one of those uttermost parts of the earth. Relatively recently, the first church was established in Nepal with 29 members. Amen. That was back in 1952, 29 members. Today, there's over 850,000. Christians in Nepal. That's good news from a far country. Did you know that more Muslims Muslims have come to Christ globally in the past 60 years than the previous 14 centuries combined? How many of you remember the hostage crisis back in the 70s? I do. That dates us more mature folks, right? In 1979, the Ayatollah vowed to crush Christianity in Iran. Crushed Christianity, 1979. There was about 500 Christians in the whole nation of Iran. Today, though, there's over 1 million believers in Iran. 1979, the amen. The Ayatollah says we're going to do away with Christianity and just crush it. But God has been drawing Muslims to himself by the thousands since then. The Ayatollah didn't understand. By the way, Iran has the fastest growing church globally of any other country. The Ayatollah didn't understand that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a declarative statement. Jesus is building his church. It doesn't matter if the Ayatollah makes threats. It doesn't matter if it's a communist government. It doesn't matter if COVID comes along. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he's doing that today. Jesus said in Matthew there, um, go and make disciples of all nations. Just a kind of a side quick lesson here on missions, and perhaps you've studied this passage before, but the word there for nations in the original language is the word ethne, and long story short, but we get the word, word people groups from that word nations, and uh, Jesus is saying that we, the Great Commission is to take the gospel and make disciples of all of the ethne, uh, people groups, as defined by things like race, 
language, culture, religious tradition, worldview, and so forth, distinct people groups. Okay? We're to take, we're make disciples of not just the 200 or so countries in the world, but all of the people groups within those nations. For example, in Vietnam, there's 119 distinct ethne within one country. In Cambodia, there's 44 people groups. In, in India, there's over 2,300 people groups in that vast nation of India. And, and the, the message here is that the gospel is good news for all of these countries and all of the ethne, right? All the people groups within those nations. For God so loved the world, red and yellow, black and white. And we could put in every ethnic group there of the 17,000 ethne in the world. For God so loved the world. Is there anyone outside the realm of God's love? No. No. It doesn't mean God condones sin, obviously. God hates sin. God is ang angry every day about sin, right? But he loves. How much, did he, how much does he love the world? Well, we look at the cross, right? He demonstrated that very clearly. Not only through his revealed word, but also through his son, Jesus Christ. So I have to get to some bad news before we go to the final point. The bad news this morning is that 3.2 billion people have yet to hear the gospel for the first time. Hence the title of the message this morning is a third of us. Over a third of the world's population has yet to hear the gospel. Places like Via, or Cambodia, this is a map of Cambodia. The red area there represents of the 15 million people in Cambodia, that 96%, hence the red area, are classified as unreached in that area. Is that compelling to us? You know, the 1040 window, if you've ever heard of that in relation to missions, you know how the globe has 10 degree, 40 degree parallel lines on it. And the 1040 window is where most of those unreached people groups live. You can see uh, there on the map, the 1040 window. All those dots represent a people group, and the red would be the unreached. These unreached people have three things in common. They have no believer in their life, okay? No believer in their life. They don't have anyone to be the light of Christ to them. It's a dark place where they live. They have no believer in their life, no Bible in their hands. They don't know God's revealed truth. They're biblically illiterate. They've never heard the gospel. They have general revelation of creation and the creator and designer, and they have a conscience, Romans 1, but they don't have God's revealed truth in his word about Jesus Christ. So no believer in their life, no Bible in their hands, and thirdly, they have no body of Christ in their area. There's no church in their area. Can you imagine not having a church anywhere to go to, to learn God's word, to hear the gospel, to fellowship, to worship, to serve, to all of that? I mean, in America, we have as many churches as we have Dollar Generals, I think, you know, or Motel 6s. Do you guys have Dollar Generals out here? Man, in the Midwest, every corner you turn, there's a Dollar General. But it's the same way in America, you know, and it's hard to fathom there's 3.2 billion unreached people in the world. This is the plight of the unreached, and unless something changes, they will bor be born, live, and die without ever being reached with the gospel. And that should, that should break our hearts. Lord, break our hearts with what breaks your heart, amen? It compelled Paul, if you're in Romans, again, turn over to Romans 15. Romans 15, if you're there. Verses 20 and 21, the Apostle Paul said this in regards to the unreached. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. Amen. That was Paul's compelling passion. Oswald J. Smith also said this. He said, we talk about the second coming when half the world has never heard of the first. Jesus said in Luke 10, 2, that we are to pray that God would send laborers into the harvest fields. And the language there is that we would beseech God. And look, listen, church, this is something all of us are to do. We may not be called to the mission field overseas. We may not be able to give a lot to missions. We can all pray, amen, as a follower of Christ. And this is a command, by the way. This is in the imperative. Pray earnestly that God would send people to that 
that 1040 window. And people to our neighbors who need Christ as well. Why are so many people unreached? Well, one reason is, I'll just share one, of why so many still unreached in the world today. We're going back to this 1040 window map. Most of the unreached people live in that 1040 window, some 7,400 red dots there, including India, the countries I oversee in Southeast Asia, a lot of concentrated unreached people groups in that area. And yet how many missionaries from the United States or from the West go to the 1040 window? About one out of 10. It's actually less than one out of 10 that go to the field, go to that area, that 1040 window. And not to discredit those that go to other places, obviously, but that's called the great imbalance in missions, the great imbalance. How can that be? Less than 10% of missions is focused on the 1040 window. That's our passion and vision. I'm going to take about three minutes here and then wrap up with the final point this morning. So Gospel Inc., if you take out the brochure that I think all of you got when you came in, does everyone have a brochure? If not, you can get one on my table after the service. Uh, you can go to more, learn more on our website at gospelink.org. Gospel Inc. is a church planting missions organization, okay? So we work in 16 different third world nations. I oversee those three in Southeast Asia. And we partner with native missionaries. A native missionary is just simply someone who was born and raised in that nation, in that culture. Okay, so they're reaching their own people. For example, a Gospel Link missionary that we partner with, say, in Cambodia, he's reaching Cambodians, and he was born and raised there. <laughs> so he's a national preacher. He's uh, a native missionary. This is the indigenous model of doing missions. Native missionaries have distinct advantages, as you can see on the screen. I'm not going to take the time to go over all these. But uh, I will focus, you know, you've got the citizenship, economic, uh, furlough, linguistic, time, cultural. My hat goes off to U.S. missionaries that go overseas and follow God's call and adapt to the culture because things are very different overseas. Here's some pictures. Overseas, especially third world nations. Housing is different in Vietnam than here in Sacramento, for sure. Okay? Showers are different in Mozambique. It's really awkward uh, when you're as tall as I am, you pull that little curtain shut and do the bath shower thing and people are walking by. You know, Kurt, you would fit fine behind there. I'm sorry, I keep coming back. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, let's go to the next picture. Uh, bugs, very different in Vietnam. This is in Vietnam, very different than here. Modes of transportation in Cambodia are different than here. Wildlife outside your hotel in Madurai, India, uh, very, very different than here. So this is the cultural uh, differences in third world nations. Food is very different. So this is a dish of raw squid that was brought out and offered to my son Trey and me on a missions trip years ago. And I, the next picture will show my son's reaction to that dish right there. <laughs> That's culture shock right there. Uh, but... Seriously, uh, you know, and again, I admire missionaries that have to ad adapt to the culture. But native missionaries like that food. You know, they're used to that culture, and it's a big advantage that they have. I would ask you this morning, this is in no way to compete to the giving to your church. That's first and foremost, okay? Not in any way competing with that. But, but uh, honestly, one reason I came from Indiana is I represent Gospel Inc. And I know the impact that a little bit of U.S. resource has in third world cultures and economies, how much leverage is impacted through U.S. partnership, and then, hence gospel link. We seek to link the church in America, Christians in America, who can send, send a native missionary to their own people. So would you consider that? We are partnering with around 1,200 native missionaries total, and uh, we seek to raise $200 a month. That's what our goal is, to raise for each of these 1,200 uh, we're growing in Southeast Asia. As I, as I said, we just started in Laos, and we're, uh, we have our national director there that I will work closely with, Lord willing, in the years to come, and also one other Native missionary. We have two guys in Laos, and so there are some profile cards on my table out in the foyer. Uh, some of these are from Cambodia, as this one, some from Laos, some from Vietnam and other countries. Family picture on the back, and uh, you, you might be here and say, you know, I I can't give $200 a month. Maybe you can. That would be amazing. 
But you can give as little as uh, the brochure says there, you know, $30 a month or anything between 30 and $200 to help get the native missionary to their, their need of 200 Actually, I have about five of these out there that just lost some support. Sponsors had to stop for whatever reason, and they need like 25 to $40 right in that range. So pretty minimal, fairly minimal. I know that's a commitment, but it's not 200 They already have a lot of their support, but they do need uh, some more. So Gospel Link started in 1998, and uh, we're grateful for the growth that he has given to us. So we have the three great motivations. Are you with me this morning still? Yeah. Man, you guys are a hot crowd. I, seriously, I appreciate your engagement and attentiveness. We're commanded, we're compelled, and then finally this morning, we are co-laborers. We are co-laborers. Co-laborers with who? Christ, that's right. We're co-laborers with God. In fact, Jesus said uh, there in Matthew 28, uh, he's, he makes a great promise at the end of the Great Commission. He says, lo, in other words, behold, listen. He says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus didn't say, go and make disciples of all nations. Pastor Kurt, you and your folks there, make disciples of your area and beyond. And then see you later. Good luck. Yeah, I'll come back, you know, I'll return and see how things are going, but you're on your own. That'd be tough. I mean, that would be a daunting task, right? He didn't say that at all. In fact, he said, lo, I'm with you always. I myself am with you. He is our co-laborer, and uh, that's encouraging. You know, that gives us, doesn't that give us courage to step out of our comfort zone and share the gospel with your neighbor? Invite your, your neighbor to church here. Cross the, cross the streets and cross the seas through, through missions engagement. Uh, you know, it gives you hopefully a, compel, a compelling desire to, to give what you can financially, not just to gospel, but to your church and other ministries as well. And also, we're partners with each other, and I wanted to mention that as I wrap up. You know, we're co-laborers with the Lord, first and foremost, and then we're co-laborers with each other. Uh, we're partners in the gospel ministry. We're not in this alone. Partnerships are powerful. You're a partner with all the other folks here at your church. To begin with, partners in reaching your area right here and partners through missions endeavors as a body of Christ here. So what can we do on a personal level? I like to consider this GPS, getting our missions coordinates lined up, maybe in a better way than what we've had our coordinates lined up. One is go. We can go. Is God calling you to career missions? You know, perhaps uh, God has put a, a nation or one of those you know, people groups in your heart for some reason. Or maybe you've been exposed to a missions trip or you know somebody that, you know, you just sense God might be leading you to the field. Would you go? You know and you go. And the mission field needs U.S. missionaries. You can go on a short-term missions trip also. You could go with my wife and I. We lead teams to Southeast Asia. I'd love to talk to you about what a 12-day, two-week missions trip looks like. Lord willing, next summer in June, we're going to be taking a team to South Africa. Mission trips are valuable because the heart won't feel what the, the uh, eyes haven't seen. You go on a missions trip. How many of you have been on a short-term trip? Man, that's great. You know, you go to the mission field and your eyes see those things. Your nose smells those, those smells. Your, your taste buds taste the raw squid, you know, and all that stuff. But you rub shoulders with people that are serving God around the world. It just is really, it's uh, inspiring. So see me at the table out there if you're interested in that. And then also pray, and I talked about that already in Luke 10 too. Jesus commands us to pray. And here is one great practical way that you can pray for the unreached. If you would go to your app store on your phone and download Unreached People of the Day. It's a ministry by Joshua Project. Unreached People of the Day, search that, download that app, and I did this morning. Every day you get a notification that, uh, of an unreached people group. So for me, it's at 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh, out here it was 7 a.m. this morning, but anyway. Uh, you know, and, and it's a reminder, oh, pray for the unreached people every day. But specifically, you get a people group to pray for that's highlighted for the day, where they're located, uh, what are the challenges of reaching them, how to pray for them. Unreached people of the day.
Okay, so go, pray, and then finally, send. Will you send a labor to the field through your partnership, your prayers, and just some financial assistance to that 1040 window? Uh, Theologian Carl F. Henry once said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Let me have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Uh, I do pray that you'd help us to have our eyes lifted up to the fields. Help us to, to understand daily that we've been entrusted with the gospel. And Lord, the world is often a lot more eager to hear the gospel, sadly, than what some Christians are to share the gospel. So help us, Lord, to be on mission for you. Give us the courage, the compassion. And Lord, I pray that your hand will continue to be upon, upon Crossroads Church, Lord. And that the greater days yet would be to come even. Thank you for what you're doing here. We give all the glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>